I'm a microbial ecologist. Um, I look at how bacteria in our bodies and in our environments, how they work, how they function. Uh, there are more bacteria in the oceans alone than there are stars in the known universe, which is a nice paradox being in a in a planetarium, essentially. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson does not have anything on our numbers. We have a nonillion bacterial cells in the ocean. That's one times 10 to the 30. We're, compared to a paltry one times 10 to the 24 stars in the known universe, we win. The real big numbers are not astronomical numbers, they're biological numbers. And that's really been something that we've taken to heart. We're very interested in trying to embrace that complexity, embrace that big data volume that we're, we're generating on a very daily scale, and try and understand microbes at their root. You, as a, as a person, are full of microbes. You have around about um, uh, 100 trillion bacterial cells in your body. You only have around 30 trillion human cells, so they outnumber you three to one. Um, and they weigh about two to three pounds of your body mass. So if you ever want to remove those last few pounds, just take a lot of antibiotics. It, it might kill you, but you know, you'll die thin, and that's a good thing, right? Um, most of them are found in your lower intestine. Uh, that's where the vast majority of them are. But contrary to popular expectation, there's pretty much no part of your body which is entirely sterile. We find bacteria in, in your, not only your intestine, but all over your skin, any, any mucosal surface, your nose, your mouth, and, uh, and the other places. We also find it inside your body, inside our lungs. Um, inside our bladder, there's an active microbiome, even associated with some of our organs. We've never been in a position as a species, as an organism, where we haven't seen bacteria. And our bodies, our bodies have evolved to expect to see those bacteria. So when we remove those microorganisms, it can change the way our bodies respond and act to things. This is a cecum. This is like the, the uh, intestine of a mouse. Um, the one on the far right, the squiggly looking one, that's the intestine of a, um, a normal, healthy mouse, full of bacteria, um, full of vim and vigor. The one on the far left, that's a distended, distorted uh, duodenum cecum. This is an organ which has never seen a bacterium it expected to see those bacteria. And when the, it doesn't see those bacteria, the organs develop in an inappropriate way, in a way that is not expected. The body evolved to develop in that expectation. Without that expectation, something happens. The organs don't develop properly. Um, this is a perfectly functioning cecum, but it's become inflamed, it's become engorged, and that's changed its properties. This removal of bacteria is not only having an effect upon a mouse where we can remove all of the bacteria, but even removing just a few of the organisms, the key organisms that regulate its system, can have an impact. And that's the, that's the organ in the middle. Um, and we see this with other things. So this mouse has a food allergy. If I, if I take this mouse and I give it peanuts, it has a significant sensitivity to peanuts, and it, it shows an allergic reaction. When the animal has no bacteria associated with it, its immune system goes into a runaway state and it shows a significant degree of inflammation. Basically, this mouse can go into anaphylactic shock because of the absence of microorganisms to make its body and its immune system work properly. What's interesting is that if we add bacteria back into that mouse, and especially certain types of bacteria, like clostridial organisms, then it actually suppresses that inflammation. We can even see neurological differences. Um, this is an elevated maze, this, this diagrammatic on the right. It's a, it's a maze about a meter off the ground. It's not much of a maze. It's more or less like a cross. And either side of this maze is a box. If I take a field mouse, a mouse I just picked up out of the field, and I put it into that box, it will remain hidden. It will stay down inside the box, and it will not show itself. It will not walk out along the way the mouse is in the picture. It will stay inside the box. Why? Because a mouse has evolved to be anxious. It's evolved a fight or flight response. In most situations, the best thing for a mouse to do when threatened with a predator is to stay hidden. If it stays hidden, it's less likely to be seen and it won't be eaten. And the vast majority of these mouse's ancestors have done that mechanism. That's how they procreated. That's why their genes are in the current gene pool. But what's interesting is that we can augment, we can change that neurological behavior by changing the bacteria inside. In fact, if we make this mouse germ-free, it loses all of that anxiety. It actually becomes incredibly brave. 
incredibly brave, but that, that's stupid for a mouse to be brave. A mouse shouldn't be brave. A mouse should stay hidden or it will get eaten, right? But this mouse will run outside of that box along the platform and sometimes hurl itself off in a, some kind of kamikaze style. It is not a sensible idea for a mouse to do this, okay? We think this is incredibly important because it has implications. A mouse is a mammal very closely related to us. And we see some similar traits in human beings. When we change their diets, we see mood shifts. We see neurological decision-making being altered by the gut ecosystem. Why? Well, the gut is linked to the brain. Not directly, but what happens in the intestine can change what happens in the brain. The reason this is is because, you know when you cut yourself and you get um, a little red inflammation, that's the body's immune system overstimulating and causing inflammation uh, to significantly, uh, to allow the white blood cells to leak out into that space and to kill off the disease-causing organisms which might colonize that area. The body has a good self-defense mechanism against probable disease-causing organisms. But the same thing happens in the gut on a regular basis. It's actually how the immune system communicates with the vast majority of the healthy organisms that live inside our intestine. It communicates by interacting through the immune system. Certain bacteria will elicit a certain type of immune response. And when that happens, the immune system stimulates nerve endings in the intestine and they really, we do have a second brain around our stomach, right? We do have um, nerve endings around there. When those nerve endings fire off, they fire signals up something called the vagus nerve into our brain, and that releases chemicals into our brain which change the neurological behavior, the pathways, and we get a different behavioral response. So the gut in of itself, the ecosystem of that gut, if you think of the, the gut as a rainforest or as a, uh, as a floodplain or as an ocean, that gut ecosystem communicates with the rest of the environment, the human being, through the immune system and can change how that organism responds to its environment. In the case of this mouse, we can make it either brave or meek and anxious. In the case of a human, maybe we can treat things like depression, anxiety, conditions which are otherwise socially and, and psychologically crippling, maybe they could be alleviated by increasing the presence of the right kinds of microorganisms in our intestine. And there is active research in the community looking at this potential, a probiotic for depression. It's not actually as science fiction-y as it sounds, and it's something we're working towards on a regular basis. We're doing this in autism as well. Um, autism is a, a genetic trait to a certain extent, but there are environmental triggers. Autism is a huge spectrum of disorders, but when we look at certain areas of that spectrum, we see that there can be environmental triggers changes in the microbiome of the individual which can lead to onset of the symptoms of autism. In a mouse model, we've been able to alter the microbiome of the mouse model using prebiotics, a change in diet, and probiotics, the addition of certain organisms, to actually d change their microflora from a disordered one to a healthy one, quote unquote, to make that uh, mouse behave in a, in a neuronormal way. I personally don't believe that that's a necessarily an ideal way to treat these kinds of conditions. There is neurological diversity in our community, which is incredibly important and vital to the success of our society. So I actually embrace neurological diversity. But there are individuals out there who are locked in, who are suffering because of their condition. And if we can help any of those individuals, we'll be doing a good deed. Bacteria can make you fat, it's true. I had a friend, um, uh, Li Ping Zhao from uh, Shanghai. He used to weigh 385 pounds. Um, he went on a diet, a traditional Chinese whole grain diet, and on this diet, it's not a particularly nice diet, he lost about 185 pounds in about nine months. So, so substantial weight loss, okay? And we checked his microbiome before and afterwards, and we found one significant difference. At the end, he was missing an organism which he had at the beginning, Enterobacter cloacea B29. When we take that organism and we place it into a mouse model, the mouse puts on a lot of weight, okay? The addition of this one organism significantly increases the way the animal processes energy. It makes the, some of the energy in the food more bioavailable to the host, so more energy goes from the food into the host, but it also makes the way the body processes energy change so that more of the food energy goes into storage and less into energy respiration. 
This causes sluggishness, but it also changes the neurological pathways of this mouse. This mouse has cravings like you wouldn't believe. It craves certain types of food. It also has a significantly increased appetite. And to, in order to do it on a controlled diet, both of these mice had exactly the same diet and exactly the same number of calories. In order to ensure that it ate only those calories, you have to control its feeding. Right? Otherwise, it will bully the other mouse and take its food. It becomes pathologically hungry. And this is a, a trait we see in certain serious metabolic conditions. Work from Cornell University right here up in, uh, in New York State, up in Ithaca, um, has demonstrated with, uh, with one of my colleagues, Ruth Lay, has demonstrated that even in identical twins, while they are somewhat more microbiologically similar to each other, they're still significantly different. They still show microbiological differences between even identical, genetically identical twins. But genetically identical twins can be either obese and lean. You, you do see this quite a lot. One, one twin is obese, one twin is lean. And when we look at the microbiological differences between these genetically identical individuals, we see that the lean twin has an increase in certain organisms such as the Christina salaceae. If I take the stool from one of the obese twins and I add it to a mouse, this twin's microbiome causes significant weight gain in a mouse, exactly the same as we see when we add Enterobacter cloaceae B29 to the mouse. Even more awesome, we take exactly the same stool sample from exactly the same woman, and we add Christensella minuta, an organism which was very much elevated in the lean twin pair, okay? And we add that into the mix and give it to a mouse, mouse doesn't gain weight. It protects against obesity. Imagine if I could package that and sell it in Whole Foods. I will make a million bucks quickly. Be totally unethical, I believe, but potentially important. Now, we haven't trialed this in humans, but there is ongoing work to look at the potential for even protective obesity-based probiotics. What if instead of having gastrointestinal surgery to remove a part of your stomach, you could instead just change the types of bacteria that live inside you and with a sensible dietary regimen significantly reduce your weight? That might have significant benefits for health in a wide variety of cases and a major benefit for the U.S. healthcare system. Right, where did the bacteria come from? Okay, where did Li Ping Zhao get his Enterobacter cloaceae B29, for example? Um, you know, where did that lean twin get all of her Christmas cella minuta? Why did it? Why did? Why was it there in the first place? Now, the the presence, the starting point of any of you as individuals. And if you go to the excellent display upstairs, you'll see a lot about this, is, is how your microbiome is shaped at the beginning of life. Um, we are starting to believe that maybe the baby isn't entirely sterile inside the amniotic sac, but for all intensive purposes, when the baby is in the womb, inside the amniotic sac, it's not experiencing externally influencing bacteria. But as soon as that amniotic sac breaks, it gets a very healthy doses of mother's microbes, okay? If it's born the normal way through the, uh, through, uh, the birth canal, and the mother, it experiences the mother's vaginal microbiota and picks up a rich contextual microflora, which actually stays with it for about the first year of life, shaping its microbial evolution. That's the starting culture, right? If it gets a cesarean section, it doesn't see that. It actually gets a skin-based microbial community. And that skin-based microbial community is not one that human beings evolved to see as infants. They evolved to see the vaginal microbial, microbial community as their starting culture. Exactly the same as if you were to brew the right kind of beer. You need the right kinds of yeasts and bacteria in the beginning to make the beer work. That's maybe my opinion. But um, I like alcoholic analogies. Um, but this is true. We see that children who are born via vaginal delivery versus a cesarean section uh, have a significant increased likelihood of developing obesity and some metabolic disorders and even some con um, asthmatic and, and allergenic disorders. So we see disruptions. They're very slight. It's not like if you're born cesarean, you're doomed. But there is a significant relationship between those two. In fact, many people have started, if they have to have an emergency section, collecting the um, sample during uh, birth and then literally manually swabbing the infant immediately after birth to colonize the child in order to allow that child to get that right start in life, okay? It's not the only place you get the microbes from, though. We used to think breast milk was sterile, which was why, essentially, we made bottled formula sterile. 
We don't do that for cows and pigs, we, but we do it for humans. Infant, breast milk for infants is not sterile. Interestingly, um, we're still working on this research in, in, in great detail, but the mother appears to actively recruit bacteria from different parts of her body um, through the lymph system held in a complex mixture of fats and immune molecules, which actually chaperones these bacteria through the body and deposits them in the breast duct. And that starts a culture. You actually get this rich contextual diet of fats and lipids and sugars created by mother, along with bacteria which are ideally suited to digest that food and make it bioavailable to the infant. Okay, so it's like a perfect mix. Also, those bacteria are really, really good at training the early immune system to recognize friend from foe, to recognize self from non-self. It changes the body's state and alters what's happening. So if you miss out on that, you might be missing out on certain early cues which could lead to the development of a healthy system. But even that's not the only story. When we go into environments such as uh, farmyards, we see a significant improvement in people's health. People growing up on farms, children especially under the age of one, have a 50% reduction in the development of asthma. I mean, they literally have a 50% reduction in the likelihood of developing that condition because they're exposed, we believe, to a significant rich microbial diversity during their first early phases. We work with the Amish community in northern Indiana. They're, they've been an agrarian society back through their, uh, their uh, forefathers in Eastern Europe for many, many, many generations. The people that these people descend from have grown up to experience a very rich agrarian microbiome from the animals that they work with, from the farm soil, from the environment, early in life. There's no iPads, there's no playing in this environment. There is just working in a good way. The kids go there. I've taken my boys down there. Oh, don't give me those grumpy looks. You loved it. And, and, and they, 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 have, they have to experience that environment where, you know, the kids have to work on the farm. You are there milking the cows in the morning at the age of four. When you're a baby, you're strapped to your mother while she's mucking out the pigs. You are working with the environment on a regular basis and getting that rich contextual microbiome. Nobody in that entire system has any food allergies. And they only have 0.001% of the population with any sign of asthma. If we take another population, the U.S. population, for example, there's 7% asthma on average in the U.S. population. If we look at another community like the Hutterites in North Dakota, where the children aren't allowed on the farm, they live a very similar lifestyle, but the children aren't allowed on the farm, uh, they're, they're kept in the houses, they actually have a 30% rate of asthma in their population. By the removal of this rich contextual experience, which they evolved, they, they um, ex uh, experienced throughout their uh, forefathers' life history, it changes their relationship to their environment and triggers some of these effects, we believe. So, what about you? How many people here grew up on a farm? One, two, three, four, five, six, not many of you. Most of you grew up in the environment you're sitting in right now. We spend 90% of our lives living indoors. If you live in Chicago, it can be significantly more, trust me. Uh, it's either too hot or too cold. This environment is mostly human skin bacteria. Every single one of you is releasing into your environment 38 million bacterial cells an hour. So if the two of you are sitting closer together, you're actually increasing your microbial sharing, okay? And the people that are sitting further apart, you're decreasing it. But all of you right now are probably mixing a very rich cocktail of human skin bacteria into this environment. But this environment, if you bring a baby into this environment, it's not like bringing them onto a farm where they get bombarded by many different things. They're being bombarded by human skin bacteria. That's their only source. Even if you have a live, grow up um, as an infant under the age of one with a dog in your home, you have a 13% reduction in the likelihood of developing asthma. Just a dog. And dogs can trigger asthma once you have it, but they can also help to prevent it. This is an incredibly interesting point. The environment in which we find ourselves living now could be fundamental to the development of the conditions we've been trying to fight. Working with uh, the Sloan Foundation, we developed something called the Home Microbiome Project, which is basically started to catalogue and understand the interactions between us and our home. The home is actually where your microbiome is. As individuals, you are exuding those 38 million microbial cells into your environment, and you're leaving your unique microbiome signature into this environment. 
each family, we have seven families here, and we have different time points. When those little blocks are more red, it means that if I swab the floor, like the kitchen floor or the bedroom floor, if I swab that floor, um, I could take the bacterial community I see there, sequence it, and I could identify the family that lived in that home based on that microbiome signature on the floor. They left behind a forensically identifiable signature, a fingerprint of their microbial cells in that environment. We can see this here. This is how many of the bacteria on an environment came from each person, because I can track that, right? This is a, um, a, a young man, 24 years old, living with his um, parents still, and uh, three dogs, okay? And um, this is no gender bias, but the person three is the mother, and the vast majority of the kitchen counter is her microbiome, okay? She is the predominant source for microbes in the, com in the kitchen, until she leaves for a little while, two days to go to her sister's house, I know this, and um, the hu husband had to take over, and that's person two, and then his microbiome takes over the kitchen counter. The kitchen floor is all dog bacteria. So we can track who's interacting with which surfaces. Not just that this family lives in this house, but which parts of the family are interacting with which individual types of surface. We can even take it one level higher. This is a young couple living with a lodger. This is um, a similarity plot. The samples, the microbial communities, so I can take a swab and I look at the community of organisms there. The closer those dots are together, the more similar they are. The red and blue dots are from a young couple, a man and a woman living together in North Chicago. Their yellow dots are a lodger living with the young couple. We can tell the young couple are physically interacting because their human microbiome samples are closer together. Interesting, you can compare this to the nose where they all look different because, weirdly enough, you don't physically interact with people much with your nose. Um, but what's great is the lodger doesn't look like the young couple. He shares some similar bacteria because he's actually living in the same space and experiencing some of that microbial interaction you get from the microbial shed from your fellow people. But overall, he's not experiencing. So I can even tell when, what people are doing in the environment in which they're living. It's getting creepy now. Maybe a little bit too big brother, yeah? Yeah, wait. So, um, we went down to uh, Florida because it was cold and, um, and worked with their, their department, the police department down there and their, um, uh, their um, uh, what do you call them, forensic team. <laughs> and we faked a couple of burglaries. We had people break into the house um, and then mess around with things, drink a Coke can out of the fridge, steal the TV, sit around, break some stuff, and then leave. And then we went in with the forensic team and we swabbed all the surfaces, sequenced the microbial communities we found there, and then we went and swabbed the owners of the home and their cat, and we swabbed their microbiomes and sequenced their microbiomes and characterized them, and removed the owner's microbiome profile and their cat microbiome profile from what we found on the floor. What was left over were the burglars. And we could identify those two burglars we used, they were students, the two burglars we used in the system, we could identify it with a 99.6% probability that it was them who burgled that house governor. That's an English saying. But um, we could identify that with an extremely high probability. If you, um, this is better than even, I, even uh, human DNA from my perspective because I get nearly the same level of accuracy with human DNA if I get a good sample. Um, and what's fascinating is if you had two identical twins burgle this place, you couldn't tell which one had burgled the house and which one hadn't. Uh, but I can with their microbiome because they each have a unique microbial profile. So it's actually better resolution than human DNA. Problem solved. Uh, we've, all we've got to do is have every one of you microbiologically registered in our database and we'll, uh, we'll solve all crime. Um, joking aside, we're actually working with the Departments of Justice on trying to utilize this information in forensic investigations in crime environments. You know, we joke, but we're still using bite marks and hair fibers to uh, identify perpetrators in a crime, which is a really lousy way of identifying a criminal. But we can, if we start to look at new methods, new mechanisms for identifying people who have invaded a space or have committed a crime, we maybe get better at doing what we do. Okay, this is my home. Uh, my wife and two kids, I mapped out our microbial interactions. Each line connecting each dot is a bacterial community moving between that surface, either noses to feet to hands, and then feet to floors, and hands to kitchen counters, and then even hands to floors for the kids. Um, this is a normal run-of-the-mill microbiome. When we add dogs into that environment, everything changes. 
This is the dog microbiome interacting with the human microbiome in the home. And it increases the amount of bacteria which are moved around, the diversity of microbes which are moved around, and actually significantly increases the similarity of people living in that space. Couples that have a dog are more microbially similar than couples that don't have a dog, purely because the dog is promiscuous with its love. It goes and hugs and kisses and, you know, doesn't mind who it gets belly rubs from as long as it gets those belly rubs. I know his feeling. Um, and that's our dog. So we rescued Bo. Bo, Captain Bo Diggly, is a, is a, uh, we rescued him from Kentucky. We rescued Bo, and he's actually significantly increasing the microbiological diversity of our home. He's playing a role in our health. And that's not just pseudoscience or guesswork. We already know that children that grow up with dogs have a less likelihood of developing asthma. We also know that if we take bacteria from the stool of a dog, especially lactobacillus bacteria, and give it to a mouse that has asthma, we can significantly reduce the likelihood that mouse will have an asthmatic attack. That doesn't mean everyone else should go out and start eating dog stool or you know, getting crazy with the dog mess, but theoretically, we can try and understand that, package it in a more palatable way, right, and give it to people in order to help prevent them from developing certain conditions which may threaten their well-being. So I want to put microbes in your medical records. I think, hopefully, I've given you a rather persuasive argument that they might play a role in some of the conditions. It's not the only role. We definitely need personalized medicine to understand what your genome tells you, um, what your endocrinological system is like, your hormones, what your, what your protein system is like. We need all the information about you, but the microbes are missing at the moment, and we want to put them back into your medical records to make sure that we have all the information about you appropriate in order to develop relative treatment strategies. One great way to do that is to monitor your microbiome daily. We developed a sensor. This sensor is a, um, a sensor that collects information immediately at the source. So when you're doing what you're doing in the morning, checking your iPhone, you can, um, you, know, you can also check your microbiome. And you may be able to, in the future, when we have enough data, identify how um, changing your diet first thing in the morning can rebalance your microbial profile. Okay? Give you an example of what I mean. This is a study which two of my colleagues at MIT did where they followed themselves every day for 365 days and looked at their microbial profile and how it changed. You can see that they're both different. This guy up at the top has more blue bacteroidetes and less purple firmicutes. Down here, this guy has more purple firmicutes, less blue bacteroidetes, and also has a lot of tenericutes and actinobacteria. That's their unique microbiome profile. You can also see that it's pretty stable throughout this year of observation, okay? Apart from two instances. Over here on the top, this, this green spike, that's a green spike of salmonella. The guy went and ate a dodgy burrito. Maybe it was on Harvard campus. You know how MIT and Harvard are at each other all the time. But that's an important event. We can identify those events in your life. Imagine if you were you know, looking at your stool. Oh, look, I actually do have something wrong with my intestine. Maybe you could get a, a, a rapid um, intervention strategy early on. Interestingly, the green blip in the lower profile wasn't from a, um, a uh, food allergy or a food, food pathogen, sorry. It was actually from the development of um, his lifestyle. He got married and went and lived in Bangkok, Thailand with his new wife for six weeks, and it changed his microbiome. He had new microbial experiences, eating different food, drinking different water, shaking different people's hands, breathing different air. It changed him. What's interesting is when he came back to the States, that change was only temporary, and he returned back to his US microbiome phenotype. So we can track people. We can understand them. And we can even do things to, um, to help develop that information state. So um, myself and a colleague, Rob Knight, and a, a few other colleagues, many other colleagues, um, formed um, something called the American Gut about three years ago, where you can have your microbiome sequenced. This is a non-for-profit organization. But essentially, what we do is we go out and um, offer people the opportunity to have their microbiome sequenced. Right now, we can tell you very little about what that microbiome is doing to your health. But what we can do is develop this as a database and then use it to contextualize all of our clinical studies and all of our research objectives so we can start to build better strategies and better therapies to help people move on their way. So um, hopefully that's given you a nice overview of the microbiome and where it sits. Um, I'm really happy to take questions, and I hope you have some interesting questions. Um, and thank you very much.